some people continue to roll in and then we will get started. Thanks everyone for coming. We are still letting people into the Zoom room and we'll be starting in a minute. Yeah, that's it sounds maybe intimidating to some. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks everyone for joining us today. I'm Amy O'Hara. I'm the president of APTU, the Association of Public Data Users. And we are very excited today to welcome John Schwabish, who's gonna be talking about some work that he and his colleagues at the Urban Institute have been doing. Uh, we are happy to be launching 2024, our webinar series with John. And we look forward to having you join our other monthly webinars. Uh, we're gonna put a link in the uh, summary of what's coming up in the chat. And we also welcome you to follow us on LinkedIn and also to uh, sign up for our newsletter so that you can be made aware of programming like this. Uh, Appdo, uh, we try to make sure that we are building network among data users whether you're using federal statistical data or state and local administrative data or other found data, we want to make sure that we have conversations about how best to use that data and how to connect with each other to learn more. Uh, so with that, I'd like to turn it over to John who can do his own introduction and also uh, tell us about the great work that they've been doing. We are recording this webinar. So if you have an objection to that, please, uh, send me a direct message. And also, if you're not on mute, I ask you to mute. During this conversation, if you do have questions, John has said it's okay to interrupt him. Uh, so either pop yourself off mute and ask a question or raise hand, or please feel free to put your questions in the chat and we will have time at the end to address those issues. Thanks, and I'm turning it over to John. Great, thanks, Amy. Uh, hi, everybody. Good afternoon or morning or evening, depending on where you are. Um, happy to be here. Happy to talk about this new work that uh, my colleagues and I at Urban have been working on as part of our longer or bigger do no harm uh, project that we'll put into the chat window in just a moment. Uh, again, just want to note that we're recording uh, for folks who can't make it, and I also see an otter pilot. Um, uh, AI in the um, in the meeting doing a live recording and transcription. So just be aware of that, that we're being joined by some kind of AI bot situation. So uh, Amy, I don't know how you feel about those. We'll have a whole other conversation about those uh, later on. So let me uh, open up my uh, slides and um, uh, and we can we can get going here. Um, and Let's see if I can get the right window. There we go. Okay, so like Amy said, I have my chat window open. 
um, should you have questions, but you can also just uh, unmute and yell at me. I'm happy to happy to do that as well. Um, so like I said, uh, this is a new uh, project uh, as part of Urban's Do No Harm project, which is uh, a series of reports focusing on how we as people working with data, that could be on the collection side, could be on the analysis side, could be on the reporting side, uh, how we can do a better, uh, take a better approach to those uh, those tasks through an equitable and inclusive lens. And so we've written uh, several reports so far uh, on a variety of topics, but let me start with where all of this came from. So the original Do No Harm project uh, came out of a discussion I had with my colleague, Alice Fang, uh, uh, who's a data visualization developer during the racial justice protest back in 2020 about how we could uh, talk about or how we could be a part of this conversation when it comes to data. And so this kicked off a what has now been a two plus year project dealing with a variety of different issues when it comes to inclusive, equitable work of data. And so as you can see, we now have five uh, five reports out as part of this report, uh, part of this project, excuse me, with two more coming out uh, in the next couple of months. Um, the the work I'm going to talk about today is, is uh, the latest in this series on gender and sexual orientation data, but we've also done um, work on race and ethnicity, we've done work on accessibility, we've done work on data privacy, and we've also done work where we're collecting perspectives uh, and expertise from other folks around the world. So I hope you'll check out the full project. I think Beth put the link into the um, uh, to the chat window um, uh, there, so you can take a look at that. Um, and before I go into um, into content, let me just do a little bit of level setting. So, uh, and anyone who's who's seen me talk about some of this other work knows I, I like to do this before I do these talks because I think it's important to just sort of identify my own experiences and my own identities uh, so that you know where I'm coming from when we're talking about these sorts of data. So I am a, uh, uh, a cisgender, straight, white male. So I come to this work with my own experiences, my own um my own privilege. Uh, but that being said, uh, this body of work uh, is really trying, the goal is really trying to help us all think, uh, I think, better about taking this equitable, inclusive lens to our work. And there are a couple ways that you can think about this, this project or, or the motivations for this project. You can take a moral or ethical position to uh, thinking about how we can be more empathetic and more inclusive uh, to the uh, work that we do when it comes to terms to our data work, um, which is fine. I'm happy to to stand on that hill and I'll, I, I can take that position. But I think you can also take a more practical position, which is the more people see themselves in the data and feel that they are being valued and respected in the data, the more likely it is they are going to use that information, the more likely it is they are going to implement those recommendations or those policy suggestions. And so um, I'm also happy to stand on that hill. So there are two ways to kind of think about this work. Um, and so as you'll see, uh, I'm gonna take a, a pretty practical approach to, to the presentation to think about how we can, we can be more inclusive in our work. But I think there's also sort of a moral ethical uh, stance that you can take here. So what we did in, in this report, and we've done in several reports, is interview experts. We've interviewed, uh, um, I think, over 30 different experts uh, in a variety of fields uh, from, uh, from methodolo methodologists, I think that's the word, methodologists, economists, sociologists, uh, data journalists, um, uh, all sorts of folks from all walks of life. Uh, doing work in this area. We also hosted, um, as we wrapped up our, our interview process, we also hosted a data walk uh, with people with uh, among with people with lived experience and from advocacy groups about how they think about uh, inclusively collecting and visualizing data around gender and sexual orientation. And the theme that comes through in those interviews and the 60 or so interviews I've done for other projects uh, is pretty consistent, no matter if you're talking about gender data, sexual orientation data, race data, ethnicity data, and that is to demonstrate empathy for the people and communities that you are uh, speaking to or working with or working on behalf of. No, behalf of. Um, and when it comes to uh, DEI data, when it comes to any data around intersectionalities, when it comes to any data around people's characteristics, I think this quote from, um, from Kevin Gian's book, Queer Data, really pulls this all together really nicely, is that when they participate in research, 
And we can think about participating in research for, for many of us who are, who are social scientists or data scientists or data analysts. Um, when it comes to participating in research, it can simply be providing their data to a survey, right? I think many people think about participating in research as you know, being in a clinical trial or being a part of a community-based participation research method, but you can simply participate by answering a survey. And when people participate in those actions, they're giving a piece of themselves to our work. And so we need to be conscious and we need to be uh, thoughtful about how we're actually going to use that information uh, in our work uh, and in our analysis. So um, having said all that, I'm gonna talk about the three aspects uh, of this work. Um, the three, the pre three sort of parts in, in, in the report. And we work through what I think is kind of the standard data workflow. Uh, first, talking about data collection. Uh, how can we collect these data, uh, these gender and sexual orientation data in a more inclusive way uh, and ultimately a more accurate way? How can we go about analyzing those data in better ways? And ultimately, how can we communicate or visualize those data in inclusive ways? And I will be upfront by saying, you know, part of the motivation for this project at the start was to focus on data visualization. And we did a lot of that in the first couple of reports. Uh, there's not as much of it in this particular report. And the reason for that is we really just don't have enough or good enough data at a nationally representative level around gender and sexual orientation data that move beyond the binary, as I'll talk about in a moment, um, to have a lot of uh, evidence and, um, and experience with how to approach those data and communicate those data in, in, better, uh, in better ways. So these are the three things we're gonna talk about. We're gonna start with uh, data collection, seems like the most obvious place to start with. And it is worth noting that the collection and the use of data around gender and sexual orientation uh, is particularly right now uh, an important topic. Um, there are more than uh, 560 bills that um, can be categorized as anti-LGBTQ uh, in just uh, the first sort of the first nine months of 2023. Um, I think many of us are from, you're probably familiar with a lot of the political discourse around uh, around uh, trans uh, and LGBTQ issues, and so the data that's collected can be used for harm. Uh, it can be used uh, to uh, to track people, as we've seen in Texas. Uh, it can be used to deny people uh, health care, as we've seen in states like uh, states like Florida. Um, and it can also be used um, to deny people programs, policies, and services. So these data, this is not just an abstract discussion. These are data that are being used right now for harm um, and uh, and and are, are as a current issue uh, in our political discourse, but also in, of course, our data discourse. So the first sort of motivating uh, question I think we as researchers on the data collection side really need to ask, as Kristen Schilt uh, told us. Did they have... I'm going to try not to get muted. Uh, thanks, Beth. <laughs> um, so Kristen Schilt told us in, in the interview that we conducted with, with Kristen, you should ask yourself as, as a researcher, as someone collecting data, why am I collecting this data if I'm not planning to use it in my project? And so the, I think that's a good motivating question about data collection. Do we need it? I think there is a, a habit. Uh, there is a, a norm of saying, we're just going to collect all the data we need and we'll see what we can do with that data later on. So let's collect data around income and education, marital status, gender, sexual orientation, region, uh, mode of transportation to work, whatever it is. And we just sort of add all of these things together. But if you don't need that information for your research project, then do we really need to collect it? So I think that's sort of the first motivating question when it comes to data collection. Do we actually need this data in our, in our work? If I click on the right window here, uh, I can talk to you about what we think researchers should think about when it comes to collecting SOGI data, so sexual orientation uh, and gender data, before designing any survey instrument. So the first thing to think about, again, do you have a, a legitimate and defensible purpose for collecting that information? And it is important to also note that I think, you know, for 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 APTU, you know, I think probably most people here are thinking about large federal surveys that are collecting lots of data for lots of different purposes. And so it can be difficult to say what a purpose, what 
you know, a purposes of the ACS or the SIP or the CPS, right? Um, so it's kind of hard to just say what a specific uh, uh, purposes of those data. But when it comes to electronic health records, when it comes to data sets with specific purposes from say advocacy groups or smaller nonprofit groups, we need to identify why we are collecting these data. Because as I mentioned at the beginning, this sort of motivation here is we are letting people, we are into our world and, or, or you know, they, I'm sorry, they are letting us into their world. And so um, we need to be conscious about uh, asking questions that we might not actually need or use in our research. The second question we need to think about is how are we guaranteeing safety and confidentiality? And when I think about this question, the sort of avatar that comes into my mind are small, generally small nonprofit groups who are collecting data for their particular topic area, or maybe even for their uh, among their employees. And I hazard to guess that many of those organizations haven't thought particularly carefully about how they are storing those data. Um, and I think there is an argument to be made around whether gender and sexual orientation data would be considered uh, PII, whether they would be considered confidential secure data. Uh, I think we would argue, the, the folks who worked with me on this report, I think we would argue that they are PII, uh, especially as you can, as, as they are being used or can be used now or for harm. Um, and so how can we guarantee safety and confidentiality? So how are these small groups collecting these data? Are they just leaving them on desktop computers? Are they just leaving them around the office? Um, and so we need to be really thoughtful and conscious about that and letting people know how we're actually going to do that in our data storage um, processes. Has the research undergone an IRB review? And we note this here um, because I think many, especially smaller organizations, don't have an IRB as part of their organization. And it's not surprising. IRBs are not, you know, they're 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 technical and they're difficult. And you have to bring in more staff who have expertise in these data collection methods. And so again, we're thinking about small organizations who might not have an IRB. But there are plenty of organizations, including universities, uh, government organizations who might be able to uh, partner with smaller organizations, might be able to lend a hand with respect to having an IRB to actually assist in these small organizations. So um, for those of us who, if you're working at a place that doesn't have an IRB, I'm sure there are plenty of people on this call who would be willing to at least share or partner with you in how they go through and have that review done on their uh, research proposals. And then finally, are you as a researcher making promises that you can't keep? Are you promising that you're going to keep and store the data safely and confidentiality? Are you uh, saying you're going to conduct one uh, line of research, but going to do another line of research? Again, we are uh, collecting data on real people. And so we need to be conscious of how the data are going to be used in our own work and then also down the line. So, uh, so before I get into some of the actual survey questions uh, and how these uh, questions are being framed, um, I just wanted to put up this, this other uh, quote from Kelsey Campbell, who told us in our interview that there's, a, there's this tension here um, between wanting to be represented in the data as an individual, but also having to trust the people who are collecting the data, right? Collecting the data and using those data for a variety of different purposes. And again, this might differ based on whether I'm taking a survey from the Census Bureau versus I'm providing data to my uh, to my doctor or providing data to a small advocacy group, that's advocacy group that might be working on, on my behalf. So what do questions, I'm gonna start with uh, gender. What do questions on gender look like? So here are six of the larger surveys that I think many of us on this call work with uh, day in and day out. So the CPS, the Survey of Consumer Finances, the Census, the Panel Study of Income Dynamics, the Computer Consumer Expenditure Survey, and the Survey of Income and Program Participation. And you'll note that all of these surveys ask this question about, question about gender or sex the same way. It's always male and female. It's always coded as one and two. And it's always coded as male as one in that first position, placing male in that prime spot as the default, as the norm. Now I'll note that if we wanna think about collecting data beyond the binary, there are bad ways to do this. And these are just four bad ways, examples of bad ways to collect these data. 
Um, I go back and forth on which is my favorite here. Um, I identify as male. So in the in the uh, menu in the top right, I would I would not know how to answer this question because I'm pretty sure male and female are both categorized as human. So I don't know what to do with that one. And the one in the bottom left makes me chuckle every time I see it. Uh, what is your gender? Uh, is it male, female, or I have no plans to purchase a new vehicle. So I'm not sure that's really a gender. I haven't seen that in any census forms just yet. So uh, uh, just there are bad ways to do it, but I wanna talk about good ways to do it. Um, it's also worth noting that people approach surveys in different ways. This is a tweet from a friend of mine in the UK who uh, says that they, when there's only these two options um, for Miss or Mrs. that they select Mr., right? And so how people respond to the surveys that they see, depending on their identity, pretending on, uh, uh, depending uh, on their uh, preferences, is going to determine how, how of, of what quality our, our data are ultimately going to be. So I want to start with probably the most important research uh, report work in this area, uh, the most recent work. Uh, this is from the National Academy. So the NASA report on sex, gender identity, and sexual orientation. So let me share with you the first, not the first recommendation of the report, but the recommendation about collecting gender ID, uh, identity data. And so the suggestion from NASA is to do this in what's called a two-step process. The first, in the first question, you ask the respondent, what sex were you assigned at birth on your original birth certificate? And of course, the question is here, how are we gonna ask that question? You can see here, they organize the questions as female and then male, um, which corresponds both uh, to the alphabet and also to the size of the population, the relative size of the population in the US. So that's the first question. And then the second question is, what is your current gender? And here in their uh, recommendations, they provide five different options. Female, male, transgender, those three are radio buttons. If the respondent is American Indian or Alaskan Native, uh, they are prompted for a fourth option, which is two-spirit, which is uh, a term that many uh, indigenous communities use uh, that goes beyond the gender binary. And then the uh, next option is I use a different term, and then there's a free text write-in option. And then there are, of course, uh, two others with don't know and prefer not to answer. So this is the core recommendation, and this is the core way many surveys have been approaching uh, this data collection effort. And so I want to show you just, just a couple of options or a couple of examples. This is from the Census uh, Bureau's Pulse Survey. So you can see here, question one is what sex were you assigned at birth, female or male? How do you currently describe yourself? Female, male, transgender, or then a free text, different term. And then they have a follow-up, which is just to confirm comparing the results or comparing the answers from Q1 and Q2. So that's the pulse. Uh, I just want to highlight here the, the word transgender in this option. So female, male, transgender. Let's look at the National Crime Victimization Survey. Uh, they do basically the same thing. What sex were you assigned at birth? This question 85 on your original birth certificate. Male, female, refused, don't know. And then the next question says, um, do you currently describe yourself as male, female, or transgender? You can see you get those options. And obviously these are conditional. And then uh, the last question is, uh, they they confirm uh, that these that these differ that the answers to these two differ, and again worth noting here in the second question the options are male female transgender or none of these so that word transgender shows up on its own, and this is interesting uh, if you think about it and if you go to our uh, if you go to the dictionary which is not the end all be all like words change and evolve, uh, but if we go and look at the word transgender. Uh, from uh, from the dictionary, you'll notice that trans the word transgender is an adjective. It is not a noun. So placing the word transgender in a list with male and female um, is, grammatically speaking, incorrect. That instead what it should be is transgender male, transgender female. And so this is part of a, 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 a not, I don't want to say a problem, but a challenge with asking these questions. Because for all the challenges I'm going to mention, what they often do is result in a longer set of questions or longer, longer set of, of options, which of course is going to result in a longer survey, which can ultimately result in a uh, uh, lower response rates. The other piece of information worth noting when the surveys ask for the person's sex at birth, um, they only provide two options, male or female. And what we're going to see over the next 
decade or so uh, is we're going to have more individuals um, who have an X marker on their birth certificate. And as you can see here, the states with the uh, pink dots uh, are the states that, uh, um, I guess, parents can choose uh, between male, female, or X marker on their birth certificate. And you can see that that number, or that number has grown over time, and I suspect it will continue to grow. Um, and so we're going to have this challenge. We're going to need this change in the, in the survey question as we see more of these um, now kids grow into adulthood and become part of our, our, our uh, regular samples uh, in a lot of the surveys that we, that we use all the time. Now, the survey that I'm most excited about that I wanted to share with you is the 2023 National Health uh, Interview Survey, the, the, um, the NHIS. Um, because what you can see in the NHIS over the last few years is they are really testing how they're going to collect these data. And the 2023 uh, questions has been a pretty dramatic shift in how they're collecting these data. Now, they're, they are out in the field right now. So um, we don't actually have the data, so we don't know how uh, this is going to pan out, but I'm very excited to see uh, what happens here. So this is the core question uh, in the uh, NHIS and the current, the current version that's out in the field. Do you currently describe yourself as male, female, transgender, non-binary, or another gender? So you can see here that they are starting to expand that first question, right? That, that, or you know, depending on this order, that, that question on how you currently describe yourself. And each of these different options is going to sort of put you into different buckets in, in the survey, in the, in the path of the survey. So if you answer this, this question, male or female, they then ask you, is, you know, that option, whichever one you chose, is that the sex you were assigned at birth on your original birth certificate? And then you can do yes, no. So that's one group. Another group is for the uh, respondents who chose the options transgender, non-binary, refused, or don't know. And they ask the same kind of question, what sex were you assigned at birth on your original birth certificate, male, female, refused, or don't know. Again, that's going to have to change. And then the fifth option, if you, uh, in the fifth selection, if you choose another gender, they then ask you uh, a simple writing question. So what term do you use to describe your gender? Now, no matter what bucket you end up in, if the answers don't match, they do the same thing that the pulse does, which is they do a um, they do ask a question to confirm the discrepancy, and then the data recorded just as the respondent answered. So it'll be really interesting to see when these data become available um, how uh, these data sort of work themselves out, and and how many different groups we have, and how many different identities we can see in the data. And I think another good way to think about sort of building kind of a cornerstone or a base for thinking about this work is um, the two, I think there are kind of two nationally representative surveys that focus on non-binary gender and sexual orientation data. And I'm going to show you the question from the 2015 transgender uh, survey. The 2022 one is out right now. Um, it's basically the same uh, questions, um, uh, but we don't, the data have not been released. So we'll, again, I'm, I'm excited to see what, what these data say. Uh, from 2015 to 2022. And um, so these are sort of the, the flag questions at the beginning. So they ask a series of questions to see if the survey is, if the person sort of qualifies to, to be in the survey. And so I just want to show you how the transgender survey, or the folks who you know created the transgender survey are thinking about asking questions for a survey that is particularly um, uh, trying to field questions among the LGBTQ IA plus uh, community. So first off, uh, do you think of yourself as transgender? Yes or no? Do you identify as more than one gender or as no gender, such as gender queer or nine binary? Yes or no? Do you currently live full time in a gender that is different from the one assigned to you at birth? So you can see it's not a two-step question. Uh, it's it's a, a single question. And then a follow-up, which is how old were you when you started to uh, started to uh, 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 live in a gender that's different from the one assigned at you uh, at birth. And then finally, someday, uh, again, a sort of follow up here. Someday, do you want to live full time in a gender that is different from the one assigned to you at birth? So you can see, I, I think we have a lot to learn. I think the, the federal uh, data collection agencies and, and any of us who are collecting data, uh, I think we have a lot to learn from these surveys that are focusing on these communities who uh, among people who identify outside the gender uh, binary. I don't want to go into too much detail um, 
uh, on sexual orientation data because that's a whole other piece of the report, um, but I, I would encourage you to do that. Um, I just wanted to note that you end up in in some of uh, some of the same um, challenges, some of the same issues. Um, this is the um, uh, this is the same. Uh, uh, same report as earlier, the NASM uh, set. This is the recommendation from NASM. Uh, this is what they suggest. Which of the following best rep represents how you think of yourself? Um, you can see there are a variety of options here. Uh, lesbian or gay. Straight, that is le that is not gay or lesbian. Bisexual, again, the two-spirit option. And I use a different, uh, a different term with a write-in. And there are, I think, two points I'd like to make about this question. First, um, you'll notice that the second option uh, is placing straight uh, as the um, uh, kind of the, not quite, but along the lines of the negation of gay or lesbian, which is which is the opposite of how it's it's always kind of been done, uh, that it's straight and then gay, uh, not straight. And so this is an interesting uh, take on how these data are collected. The other interesting piece is on the language that we use. Um, and one of the things that we heard in, in many of our interviews is that many people or people, I don't know many, but people uh, who live or who identify within the binary, who have that privilege, aren't necessarily familiar with many terms that uh, the LGBTQ uh, community uses every day. And I want to show you just one image I found on Twitter. I think this really kind of like summarizes the whole thing um this uh this person took a picture of of a uh of a uh survey where a sexual orientation question where the options were heterosexual gay or lesbian bisexual and then other and they wrote in straight and the quote here straight isn't an option anymore so like i think this really summarizes some of the challenges um with words and phrases that we that we use in our language that are not necessarily familiar to everyone and this this quote, uh, and it's something that I've been saying in <laughs> a lot over the last couple of years, is that um, a lot of this is a problem of language, right? That language is nuanced, language is changing, language evolves. So that words or phrases we use today are not necessarily words or phrases that we used yesterday. And I think uh, in in this context, I think a, an interesting um, an interesting word is or to 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 uh, to emphasize this point on the evolution of, of terminology is the word queer, uh, where the word queer has uh, for many years been used as a derogatory, hateful word, um, but many younger people are reclaiming that word. And I think we are seeing an evolution in the usage and the ownership of the word queer uh, that we haven't seen uh, haven't seen to date. So again, whether we'll use continue using that word going forward uh, and how it's changed over time, I think are, are certainly interesting patterns. So that's a section on, on data collection. I wanna talk relatively briefly on data analysis. Um, and there are two, maybe three interesting parts about gender and sexual orientation data when it comes to the analysis. The first question is, what do we do particularly about groups with a smaller number of individuals? Do we lump them together or do we split them apart? And so this is a this is a challenge um, because what we end up doing uh, is we have this this tension, right? On the one hand, we want to have larger groups so that we can create statistically meaningful results, to make statistically meaningful uh, comparisons. But on the other hand, uh, when we uh, lump groups together uh, to create larger groups with more people, we end up erasing or masking the identities of the people who selected those options in our survey. And so this lumping, is you, this is from the, the NASM report, uh, when this lumping occurs, although the respondents had the opportunity to express their identity, in the end result, they're erased from the analysis. And again, I don't think there's a, a solution here. Uh, I don't know how we're going to resolve or, or solve this particular challenge, um, other than just increasing sample size, uh, which is going to uh, increase costs and increase time uh, that we need to to. Uh, to collect data. Um, but I think I think at least the one thing we can all do, uh, and this is for, for all data, um, is that we can think about more carefully what's going on behind the aggregate groups that we're using in our standard analyses. So what's happening? What is the variation like uh, going on behind the data so that we, we just have three or four categories around 
any of these uh, any of these identities, um, what are we missing when we are presenting those results? The other interesting piece around this is language uh, as we think about translating from, in the US at least, from English to other languages. And I want to share with you one set of results uh, from a, a paper here by Stuart Michaels and his and colleagues. What they did was they issued a survey um, to English speak native English speakers and native Spanish speakers. So for the native English speakers, they asked the question on the left, which of the following best represents how you think about yourself? And you can see there are four options there, lesbian or gay, straight, that is not lesbian or gay, bisexual, something else, and I don't know how to answer. So that's the, the English question. Uh, the Spanish question, which I am not going to try to pronounce the Spanish. I just, it's just not in my wheelhouse, not something I'm, I'm going to try. Um, they asked basically kind of the straight um, almost kind of the straight translation of the word um, and, and, you know, direct translation of the word, I should, I should say, right? So instead of using the word straight, as you can see in the English version, they use the word heterosexual uh, in, the, in the Spanish version. And of course, they, they distinguish between male respondents and female respondents. So what did they find? Well, they found that almost 60% of non-LGBT Spanish speakers did not select the heterosexual uh, category. Um, and they went through and did follow up interviews with people, and they found that mainly the, the the sort of the reason why so many people selected something else is because they had difficulties understanding the term heterosexual. And so thinking about how different languages uh, encode or or use uh, these pronouns uh, and these descriptions of people and their identities is a real challenge, and is something I know the Census Bureau is working on. Um, be, because we spoke to them uh, at length. Um, and I'm grateful that they they took the time out of their, their schedules to, to talk to us. Um, but this is a real challenge and not just from English to Spanish, but also to many other languages um, that are not structured the same way as English in the way that uh, the grammar is actually built underlying it. The final thing that's interesting, uh, I've kind of already mentioned this a little bit. Uh, the other thing that's interesting on the analysis side is how we, um, how we as researchers uh, consider and think about using the the quote unquote other group. And again, to think about how this word other literally others people, I went back to the dictionary. And you know the the word other, I found it really interesting, right? If you go down to the fifth entry in the dictionary, you find this this entry in the dictionary around the word other disturbingly or threateningly different, which I think is a really interesting connotation around the word uh, around the word other that this group, is somehow a disturbance, somehow a threat. I don't know to whom, but to think about how that um, how that matters and uh, in 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 the English language. And so we spoke to people about how we could think about uh, replacing that word other with with different options. Um, and a lot of people we spoke to suggested the word and other. Um, the grammar doesn't quite match up, but you know that's okay. I think we can deal with that. But we have come down with, with seven possible alternatives to the word other. And I'll note that all of these alternatives are factually true, right? So when the person gets to the survey, they get down to the you know selection for other, and that's the, that's the option they select. It is true that their identity is not listed uh, on the survey. Um, now I'll, I'll just say that, you know, um, I struggle with this for a while um, because it is also true that the person who the, the survey respondent selected the checkbox or selected the option for the word other. And so the question or the, the sort of struggle that I had is, is it okay for me as the researcher analyzing these data, is it okay for me to change that word, right? And I've come down uh, where I, I, I don't think it's that, I think I was sort of overthinking it a little bit, but where I've come down now is, you know, if I'm using the ACS or the CPS and the option is other, I might change it to say, I don't know, identity not listed, and I'll just make a note somewhere in the in the in the graph or the or the report to just say the ACS uses the word other, and we've decided for purposes of our of our work to uh, change it to identity not listed. So, okay. Before I get into data communication, I see there are a couple of questions here. I'm just gonna take a quick peek here. Um, Yes, and both of these are, uh, whoops, make sure I go up. Yes, so Rose says that people can change 
uh, their um, their uh, um, their gender on their birth certificates when they're above a certain age. Yes, that is that is that is also true. Um, and it will depend on the that map will show you uh, what um, what requirements there are to actually do that, and they vary state by state. Now, it is an interesting question um, about changing it from so there so in a state that requires has certain conditions. I don't know. I'm guessing maybe there's not an overlap in the states to go from say male to female versus going male to X. Um, I would guess in the more restrictive states, you actually there is no X option. Um, so, but they, it definitely varies by state. Um, and Jackie mentions this difference between male and female as measuring sex versus woman and man measuring gender or meaning gender, um, and certainly true. And we struggled with this a bit. Um, and the NASM report goes into this a little bit more. Um, and while um, uh, your point is is uh, absolutely true, I think many people use those words interchangeably. And so we didn't dive into too much more detail than than the NASM report um, because um, uh, because of that sort of common usage. And the other uh, point that that Jackie mentions is the option I prefer to self-identify. Uh, which which I also like, but the other option I actually sort of become even more um, uh, that I like even more is just the option I am with a colon, right? So like it's just I am, and then write in whatever whatever that is, right? And whatever that whatever that identity is. Um, so that open ended question. So you know I prefer to self identify is is perfectly fine, but I'm starting to come down where I really like this option I am, um, and just keep it. Uh, keep it very simple and let the, the person self-identify that way. All right, so let me finish off with data communication. Um, this quote that is from our first report, um, I think is a really nice uh, way to think about this. Um, if I were one of the data points on this visualization, would I feel offended? So, and that refers to language that's used, how colors are being used, uh, the icons that are being used to encode the data. Would you, as the creator of this graph, the writer of this report, would you feel offended if you were presented or described or shown in that particular way? Whatever your identity is, swap out whatever's in that graph for your identity and, and think about it's just a, a simple way to sort of think about this, this uh, idea of demonstrating empathy. How would you feel if you were described in that way? So as I mentioned at the beginning, I sort of come to this, this, this body of work thinking about it from the data visualization perspective. How can we be more inclusive and equitable in our final products? And from that perspective, you know, I think for gender and sexual orientation data, it is a little bit difficult because there's just not as much data out there to sort of build the body of, of work. And when it comes to color, it's even kind of more complicated because if we think about what we would base our decisions on, well, the pride flags, um, and these are just three of them, the pride flags use all the colors in the rainbow. And so how would we think about colors that may or may not be appropriate uh, to uh, to encode these data? Now, one thing I think, um, uh, I think we can generally, I would say generally avoid is uh, kind of the colors that are used here, the baby blue and baby pink for, for men and women. Um, they sort of reflect uh, stereotypes and, and perceptions of stereotypes. And it should be noted that there are plenty of news organizations that don't use the baby blue, blade, ah, excuse me, baby blue and the baby pink for men and women. Um, and so there's also a tension here. I, I completely acknowledge the, the tension when I, I'll go back. When you look at this uh, graph, uh, you probably can guess, even without looking at the labels, that the pink is going to be women and the blue is going to be values for men. Um, and so uh, that is not uh, as immediate as an interpretation when you use colors like these. But I think if we want to move beyond these uh, these stereotypical colors, uh, I think this is one way to think about it, that we don't have to use those same colors over time. Uh, the same thing certainly holds true when it comes to icons. Um, this is a graph that many in the data viz world sort of derided for a long time. You know, the the icons are scaled not by height, but by uh, size or by area. Um, it's got the stereotypical icons of a, a woman in a dress uh, with the with the with the pink colors. And I used to make fun of this graph. I, I used to say, "Oh, I bet women in India are really offended by this graph." And then um, there was a uh, I uh, had a student who was from Latvia, and she was like, "Well, 
I'm pretty offended by this graph. Like I'm not some huge giant person that towers over, you know, everybody else in the class. Um, and I just want to share with you a quick, uh, this is from a tweet from, um, Saba Ibrahim, who's a who's a photographer, and she tweeted out, as an Indian woman, I can confirm that too much of my time is spent hiding behind a rock, praying the terrifying gang of international giant ladies and their Latvian general don't find me. So uh, uh, I think kind of a comical, fun tweet, but I think also kind of like the perfect example of how people see themselves in the data, even in this very simple graphic people see themselves in the data. And again, if we want people to use our recommendations, use our data for uh, for change and for improving policy, I think we need to keep that into account. I also wanna think about icons more. Uh, this is from a fundraising email that uh, Dan Crenshaw, who's a Republican out of Texas, uh, sent out in March of 2022. Um, and so I wanna describe this. I know the text is small, I'm gonna blow it up in a second so you can see this, um, but the icon at the top is an icon that we would stereotypically identify as, as 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 a woman, and the question says, "Is this a woman? Yes or no?" And then at the bottom is uh, an icon of what we identify as as a man. Is this a woman? Uh, yes or no? And so the text at the top says, "You might not be a biologist, but are you smarter than a nominee for the U.S. Supreme Court? Let's find out." And then there are these two images, and at the very bottom it says, "Good luck passing this extremely complicated test." I don't think I need to tell you that these icons are just based on history and stereotypical behavior. I don't think I need to tell you that the way people dress does not uh, directly correlate with their gender or with their sexual orientation. So I think we can all acknowledge what's uh, motivating this particular fundraising email, but I think we can also acknowledge um, that uh, that I think it's an, an unfair uh, and um, an incorrect characterization of people and gender. And if you go to find gen find icons these are just four that i picked from the noun project i think designers are also struggling with this um and and i'm just going to assume that people the the people who design these icons are 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 trying and they are they are struggling with this but again if you take that empathetic approach if you turn your perspective around how would you feel if you if your identity was described with a question mark like that's the that's the icon that's going to be used to describe you as a person. I just don't think that's the sort of icon, sort of um, uh, imagery that we want to use to describe people. It is also worth noting, um, and I'm sure this isn't gonna shock anybody, but the use of our icons and the tools that we use to uh, find or generate our icons are rooted in sexism uh, and a sexist past. Um, if you go to Google right now and use a do an image search for the phrase nurse icon, you're gonna find page after page of icons that we would identify as feminine. And similarly, if you redid that for boss icon, you would find images uh, or icons that we would identify as masculine. And so there's a bias in uh, what, I don't even wanna say what people are creating uh, because that's not what this represents. I mean, it does kind of a little bit, but what our, what our search, uh, certainly what our search terms are revealing to us. And the problem, and I would identify this, I would argue this is a problem. Uh, the problem extends to the newer artificial intelligence terms. Uh, there's a great story by the Washington Post from November um, where they generated a uh, number of different artificial intelligence images, or number of images using using AI. Uh, they, you know, for example, uh, the prompt for attractive people uh, generates uh, images of people who are young and light skinned, and uh, a prompt for Muslim people uh, generates uh, images of men with head coverings. So you can see these sort of icons and these images. Uh, um, in our even newer tools. And finally, this is just a picture I took of a, of a bathroom, which again, like I, I get the instinct here. I understand the instinct of, of the restaurant to say, it doesn't matter what you are, right? You could use any bathroom you want. Um, and I get that it's kind of fun. Maybe it's a little clever, but again, is this how we want to depict people as an alien, as, uh, as a person? When instead, really all you need to know for using a restroom is whether it has a stall or not, and whether you know uh, um, uh, a wheelchair can actually fit into the door. Um, and so I, I understand the motivation here of what's going on in the sign, but I also think it's worth thinking a little bit deeper about what it says about people who don't identify in the gender binary. Okay, so just to wrap up, and then we'll have about 10 minutes for questions. Um, we as researchers, as, as people collecting and using data, we've got to tell people why their data are being collected, right? It just can't be used for any purpose that we want. We really need to think about why the data are being collected and, and really collect it if and only if we need it. 
Privacy and safety are serious and real concerns, especially among vulnerable groups within the LGBTQ uh, community. So I think we need to think of that, of that really carefully. Um, there isn't one way to collect these data. Uh, as I mentioned, we don't have a, a, in the US at least, we don't have a lot of these data. And so I think lots of different agencies and organizations are finding their way and, and trying to figure out what are some of the best uh, strategies to collect these types of data. As I mentioned earlier, language to language translation can be complicated, uh, both in your sort of uh, in the more common uh, languages in the US like Spanish, um, but it's even more complicated for other languages that that you know that are not necessarily romance languages that fall in sort of that, that broader category. And finally, uh, I'll just say that uh, doing SOGI research research is just like doing any good research. It's just like doing any research around people and around communities who are providing information to you so that you can better understand the world, so that you can under make better recommendations and suggest better policy uh, uh, solutions. So I'll close with uh, with this slide um, that, uh, again, data uh, are a reflection of the lives of real people, that people are letting us into their world when they provide us with their data. And so we need to think about how these data can be used to help offer solutions um, can uh, and, and recommendations that will actually be used by by people, and so there's a lot going on in this in this space in this literature around uh, using collecting and using uh, SOGI data. But I think if you consider just some of the uh, issues I've talked about today, um, not that they're rules or guidelines, but just things to think about, I think we can ultimately end up in a place and sort of evolve over time into a place where uh, these SOGI data can be used uh, can be used and be used well. So I'm going to stop there. Uh, there's about 10 minutes uh, time for questions. Uh, thanks, everyone, for, for uh, coming on today. I really appreciate it. And um, yeah, uh, happy to answer any questions you have. That's great. Thanks, John. Uh, if you have any questions, please use the raise hand or just unmute yourself and and ask him some questions. John, I was reminded whenever you showed that thing saying that people didn't observe that the first entry was heterosexual and they wrote in straight. Yeah. Uh, when census was doing form design and people wrote in that they were Central America when they were from the central part of the United States. So. In, yeah. Surveys. I guess it's true, kind of, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, until we get a raised hand, what sort of feedback have you received since the release of this? And then Eileen has. And then we go to Eileen. Yeah, I mean, we've gotten a, a lot of great feedback. I mean, I, I think it's one of these areas where a lot of the work is kind of buried in academic journals, which I think is just generally the, the problem. So um, we've talked to a lot of uh, advocacy groups uh, about this. And one of the groups I, I spoke to were starting to sort of build out, trying to build out maybe some future work of, there's a lot of um, uh, folks at like state agency level who are working in these areas and we're, and, and like the practices are kind of all over the place. And so we're talking about how we might come together to build like a community of practice so that people can learn, learn from one another. Um, I think that for me is the most exciting kind of really tangible thing that we've seen um, in response to this report. Um, and so uh, I think that's, a, that's for me, that's the most exciting part right now um, because there's a lot of action going on and uh, we'll see if we can, we can sort of try to build that out a little bit. Uh, yeah, Eileen, I see your, your virtual hand up. Yes. Hi there, John and Amy. Thank Hi. you so much for having this convening and for, you know, talking, dare I say straight about issues and, <laughs> and, <laughs> and, um, and considerations. Um, I do work for state agency and oh. I took your, your quote and I printed it out. I popped it in the chat and I placed it all around strategically on the two floors that my agency occupies. And I said, you know what? You need to think about the real people behind the numbers. Yeah. Um, but a couple of points. One, that language changes. My youngest is um, gender fluid and they teach me something new every time we have a conversation. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I really, I don't know how <laughs> we would possibly be able to um, keep pace. And yeah. and that might vary also by geography as well as by social oh, that's group. That's a really good point. Yep. Yeah. Um, but two, have you, have you, 
taken various surveys and various presentations of gender, sexual identity, whatever other identity descriptor you would like, and run them past people who consider themselves to be in different social groups. Um, actual youth. Oh, you, know, you mean have we adults. have we shown them to have we shown the examples to to other folks? You mean? Right. To to yeah. members of that community yeah. to say, hey, what do you think? Yeah, yeah, we have. Um, I mean, it's. I mean, some of the some of the reactions we've had. So, uh, I guess I could be a little bit more specific. So we we had uh, we interviewed probably more than thirty people um, from different, uh, you know, different experts, but also people with different lived experiences. We also had a mm -hmm. data walk where we uh, invited uh, people with lived experiences to to react and reflect on the questions. We also had an advisory board. Um, that went that went through again among uh, who we talked about in the you know who are in the in the back of that report and uh, I'm happy to connect anybody in this call with with any of the members of the advisory board they are top notch um, you know I I don't I mean our approach to those questions is certainly different than um, running the survey right so our questions were more about you know how do you think are these questions useful in the way that they're framed? How do you think the data are going to be generated out of how these questions are framed? Which I'm certain is different than how, for example, the Census Bureau is doing it, where they'll run a test among different groups um, that identifies LGBTQ to see how those questions sort of work or, or don't work. So our our interviews are a little bit different in that we're sort of not asking people to actually take the survey, but to reflect on the questions in the different surveys. So that's how we mm -hmm. did, that's how we sort of generated this, this, this written document it was from those interviews. And then, and then obviously the, the wealth of literature that's out there from a, you know, a number of different great scholars. So. Excellent. Thank you. But I, but I, Eileen, I, I totally agree with you on, on the language uh, piece. And and also I, I should highlight the regional piece, um, and we saw mm -hmm. this in the in the racial work sort of even a little bit more. Um, you know the word uh, Latinx, for example. Like there's a, there's plenty of of surveys that show that the word Latinx in sort of nationally representative surveys is not prefer preferred by people who identify as Hispanic or Latino. But I mm -hmm. would put money down that there are different. You know, I, I I would put money down that that differs by age and generation for for sure, mm -hmm. um, and probably region of the country as well. That there are different communities who who like the word Latinx and and those that don't. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think if you're like you know, Eileen, you said you're working with a with a state agent, work at a state agency. You know, if folks in your state like the word Latinx, that's great. So what if you do? What do you kind of do if you're the Census Bureau, right, where you're doing a nationally mm -hmm. uh, representative study or or survey? It's much, it's much, much harder, I think. Um, but there, so there is an advantage to kind of being geographically um, uh, specific because you can ask mm -hmm. people in your locality what words, phrases, excuse me, do you do you uh, do you uh, prefer? And um, I think you have, uh, I think there's an there's there's an advantage there in some ways. Well, and I think too, I'm just continuing to riff on the thought with language. So if you have different people speaking Spanish with different language origins, mm -hmm. um, we will sometimes, we will often have things translated into Spanish because mm -hmm. we want to reach Spanish speaking families and Spanish reading families. And um, how it will be translated could differ depending upon where the translator is from. And so Absolutely. Your, to your age point, I was really surprised when my uh, 70 something year old neighbor who happens to be homosexual used a term that I'd only ever heard my 20 mid 20 something year old non-binary <laughs> child use. I was like, Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. Thing across yeah. Ages. So it's, it's, I'm constantly learning. Yeah. And, and so, you really know, we, uh, you know, we, we, we interviewed a couple of people and we, you know, a couple of our uh, interviewees who are, uh, who are gay and are older really mm -hmm. They told us they really hate the word queer. Um, you know, they yeah. they they identified as from that era where it's, it was used for not just you know not just hate but violent you know violent acts. You say they probably got beaten up as they were right, being called. Right. Right. I mean, yeah. you know, 
And, but that word is, is, you know, being, I think in, in many cases, you know, people are trying to reclaim it, but I don't think you can, you know, you can't certainly can't erase the history. Um, and so, you know, uh, it, it is, it is interesting and there's obviously a short term versus a long term, um, mm -hmm. how, how that these words will be, will be used. Yeah. It's, it's certainly not, um, it's why we keep working on this time on this topic. Cause there's no easy answers to this. So. Absolutely. So thank the, you for, for all of Look forward to reading your upcoming guides as well. Awesome. Thank you. Well, thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, we have the link in the chat and I'll put it in there one more time to get you to uh, the great Do No Harm series and this particular guide. And we look forward to seeing you in about five weeks for our next AppDo webinar, which is going to be Connie Citro talking about the work that they did looking at the results of the 2020 and also looking forward to the 2030. Uh, but again, thank you, John. And uh, we're really pleased that you were able to join us today. And if folks have questions, uh, please join us on LinkedIn. That's just put the link into the chat. So thank you and have a great afternoon. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Amy. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thanks very much. Be well. Thanks. Bye. Bye, Bye all.